Well, good morning. Welcome to Faith Community Church of the Nazarene. I'm Pastor Derek. I want to wish you a very Merry Christmas as we are um, in the second week of Advent. Um, I hope that each of you had a chance to grab a bulletin out there. There's lots of great information. Inside of there, you're going to find our visitor cards. And if you're visiting with us this morning, I'd ask you to take some time and fill that out. We want to connect with you more than just right here on Sunday morning. And so if, if you're visiting with us, uh, take some time and fill that out. We're not going to spam you or anything like that. We just want to begin to build a relationship. And as the offering plates come by in just a little while, I would ask that you uh, drop it in the offering plate. Consider it your offering for today. On the back side are our prayer cards. Because part of that connection is we want to be praying for you. If, if tough times come, if, if great things are happening, whatever the reason, we want to be praying for you because we believe that God honors our prayers. And so if you, if you have a prayer request, if you have a praise, if something's going on in your life, and I know that something is going on in everybody's life, if something's going on in your life, I would ask you to, to write that down and, and place it in the offering plate as those come by. And if you got a bulletin this morning, then I know you got one of these cards. And so everybody, if you got a bulletin, I'd ask you to take this card out, and as the offering plates come by in a little bit, uh, whether you fill it out or not, everybody drop it in the offering plate. That'll save me from having to go collect them later. It'll save us from having to print more um, and all that good stuff. Inside the bulletin, there's lots of great information. Um, next week is our children's program. The kids are going to be leading us through worship. We're going to be singing Christmas songs, and they're going to tell us the story of Jesus. And so I would encourage you to bring your friends, bring your family. Um, this is a great time to bring grandparents. Unchurched people will, will come and listen to kids tell the gospel more than they'll come listen to me. And so uh, and immediately after that, uh, we're going to have a potluck. And so we're going to gather all our friends and family for the children's uh, program, and then we're going to feed them afterward. So uh, I, I would encourage you to, to prepare for that, to invite friends and family. Uh, again, there's lots of great information in there. I'm not going to read it all to you. But I would encourage you to use this information and to become involved in the life of your church. Um, if there are no other announcements, I will ask the ushers to come forward, and we'll receive the morning tithes and offerings. Come set your rule and reign in our hearts again. Increase in us, we pray. Unveil why we're made. Come set our hearts ablaze with hope like wildfire in
Lord Jesus, I thank you, Lord. I thank you for coming. Lord, I thank you for watching over us. Lord, you did not have to come. But it was of your grace and your mercy, Lord, that you came to this earth, that you bore our sin, that you bore our punishment, that we might be with you. And so, Lord, we thank you for that today. And we humbly bow before you, knowing that you are Lord of all creation, that you are the only one who is worthy of our praises. And, Lord, that you love us, that you care for us deeply. Lord, that, that our burdens are your burdens. And so, Lord, this morning we lay our burdens at your feet. Lord, we pray for Esther as... As she has an, uh, an upcoming appointment, Lord, we pray for healing. We pray for wisdom. We pray for discernment that you would guide to the, the correct course of action. Lord, I pray for Jody McGaffey as she's continuing to undergo treatment for cancer. Lord, that you would, again, bring healing. That you would continue the work that you have already begun in her. And Lord, that, that you would bring restoration. We pray for Bernetta Sapp as, as she is facing many of the same issues. Lord, I pray, I pray for peace. I pray for comfort. I pray for her family. Lord, that, that you would strengthen them, that you would comfort them, that you would encourage them during these difficult times. Lord, I, I pray for those who have lost family members especially during this time of Christmas when, when we want nothing more than to gather with family and to celebrate your birth. Lord, the loss of a loved one can, can leave us with down spirits. Lord, I pray that even in the face of that, that your love, that your grace, that your mercy would shine through. Lord, that, that we would realize that despite what's going on in our lives, we have much to praise you for, that we have much to be thankful for. Lord, I thank you. I thank you that you speak into our lives, even those in this community, Lord, for the hurt, for those who are struggling, those who don't know where to go or where to turn, those with family problems, financial problems, just problems that seem too much to bear. Lord, above it all, you are still God. Despite the problems we face in life, you are still God and you are still on your throne. 
Lord, that is something to celebrate. That is something to be thankful for. And so, Lord, we praise you and we thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your mercy in this time of Christmas as we, as we prepare for your coming. Lord, we praise you and we give you thanks. Lord, I pray that we would experience your goodness, that we would experience your glory even this morning. May your spirit fall upon this place. May we know that we've been in the presence of the Almighty God. Lord, open our hearts to hear your word, to hear the speaking of your spirit this morning. We thank you, Lord, for this Christmas Advent season. We pray that you would fill us this morning. We pray this in your matchless and holy name, Lord. Amen. They say that no one likes change. Of course, they also say variety is the spice of life. So which is true? Or is there a difference? Maybe it's that we think of variety as a choice, that is, change that we can manage on our terms. We like options. Which one of the hundreds of cable channels to watch, where to go for lunch today, who we align ourselves with politically? But likely variety changes is not like that. It often doesn't happen on our terms. Unexpected news. Uninvited guest. Unplanned life event that happens to all of us. And we can try to manage change as best as we can. But we can't prevent it. We are not in control as much as we like to think. When our status quo is invaded with troubling news, it can be unnerving, as it was for a young girl whose quiet life was suddenly disrupted by an uninvited messenger with news of change like none other. Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. And even though these were glad tidings, very glad tidings, in fact, Sometimes even good change carries with it a heavy burden. It is then we must decide who is in charge of the change. The young girl knew and responded well. Peace does not come from our ability to control what God allows in our lives, but from our response to him. Let's reflect on our response to our changing world in light of God's sovereign plan as we light the second candle of Advent. Back in the mid to late 90s, the internet was just beginning to find its feet. This was the era in which companies like Shutterfly, eBay, and Amazon were born. It was a time of great economic growth, and there was a lot of excitement about what was to come. Stock markets were booming, and there was much optimism about the future. However, there were those who spoke against this growth. They said that it was unsustainable, that it wouldn't last. They said that like a bubble being popped, it would suddenly burst and lead to the ruin of many. 
These naysayers were mocked and ridiculed. They were ignored and discredited. Nobody wanted to hear what they were saying. This common reaction to bad news is often referred to as shooting the messenger. Stories are told of kings who, when they received bad news of war or an uprising, they would kill the one who brought the bad news, preferring to live in short but peaceful ignorance rather than face reality. Those who spoke out against the dot-com bubble were ultimately proven right. But that doesn't change the fact that the majority didn't want to listen to them. They were ignored and they were, they were spoken against because nobody wanted to face the truth. We shot the messenger. Have you ever shot the messenger? It's an understandable response. Some of us are more active in our disregard. We, we actively seek to silence those whose message we don't want to hear. Others of us are more passive. We plug our ears, we bury our heads, we cover our eyes, hoping that, that when we open them once again, the bad news will be gone. We each respond differently to bad news, but this morning I want us to take a look at a young woman and her response to an unexpected messenger. If you have your Bibles, I encourage you to turn with me to Luke chapter 1, starting with verse 26. If you have your phone with a, or tablet with a Bible app, that's fully acceptable too. I will be putting the words up on the screen. Luke chapter 1, starting with verse 26. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, we read about Elizabeth last week, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored, the Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. How will this be? Mary asked the angel. Since I am a virgin. The angel answered, The Holy Spirit will come on you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age. And she who was said to be unable to conceive is in her sixth month. For no word from God will ever fail. I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May your word to me be fulfilled. Then the angel left her. Mary could have shot the messenger. She could have plugged her ears. She could have ignored what was being said. She could have taken either of these approaches. And perhaps she was tempted to. After all, it says that she was greatly troubled at what she had heard. Yeah, maybe she wanted to shoot the messenger. And when that messenger is an angel, it's a little hard to do just that. No, Mary didn't shoot the messenger. Neither did she plug her ears and ignore his words. But as a result of being deeply troubled by the greeting she had just received, Mary responded with fear. And that makes sense. Fear is the proper response to such a situation. Anger and distress, when they are powerless, they can easily turn to fear. And Mary certainly fits that bill. She was powerless. While we know Joseph's Davidic ancestry, we don't know a whole lot about Mary. We know her name. We know that she was a virgin. Because she's pledged to be married, we can deduce that she was about 12 or 13 years old. While we don't know a whole lot about Mary, we do know a great deal about her son. While Mary's identity is brief, her son's 
is renowned. He will be great, the son of the Most High. While Mary's heritage is short, her son's heritage is great and will extend the reign of David with an everlasting kingdom. Mary's first response to the angel was fear. But before too long, that, that fear began to manifest itself as disbelief. How can this be since I am a virgin? It's a valid question. I mean, when Zechariah was told that his wife would become pregnant, he at least could look back to the story of Abraham and Sarah. He could see how God had given them a child in their old age. There was precedent for what he was experiencing. Everybody knew how this whole baby-making equation worked. Mary rightfully raises the impossibility of what God was going to do. How could she, who was missing half of this whole baby equation, how could she have a baby? The answer, of course, is God. The Holy Spirit would accomplish this miracle. It was nothing that Mary had to do. It was nothing that Mary would do. It was simply the favor of God. And that's what this season of Advent is all about. Preparing for the favor of God. Just as Mary had to wait a season to see the favor of God physically manifested itself in the birth of Jesus. So we are waiting for the favor of God to be fully present at Jesus' return. We can take three cues from Mary's response that acknowledge God's favor and that will help us to respond faithfully and move from a place of fear to a place of peace. First, Mary acknowledges her position before God. After the angel delivers his message, Mary responds by saying, I am the Lord's servant. Most of our translations here are, are a bit generous. The Greek word used here is doule, and it's translated as servant in our translations, but our idea of servant and the first century idea of servant are a little bit different. A more accurate translation would read, Slave. I would assume that the translators use the word servant due to the, the negative connotation that, that our modern society places on the word slave. When we think of a slave, we immediately jump to the evil slave owners who abuse and mistreat their slaves, and that most certainly is not God. However, there is one great distinction between a slave and a servant. And that's the reason that I believe slave might be a better translation. And that is that a servant has rights. In America, we are, we are very big about rights. We're very concerned with our rights. We have the right to bear arms. We have the right to free speech. We even have people arguing that, that free education or free health care are a right. Even our public servants band together in unions in order to protect their rights. A servant has rights, but a slave has no rights. And this is what Mary was acknowledging before God. In this affirmation, Mary is an example to every follower of Christ that has come after her. When we acknowledge Jesus as Lord in our lives, we give up our rights. This is what it means to confess that Jesus is Lord. In doing so, we admit that God doesn't owe us anything. We give up our perception of rights that we think that we have. We submit ourselves as slaves to God. Because if you think that God owes you anything then at some point you will be afraid of God. Fear is the natural response when we put ourselves over someone who is obviously greater than us. Fear is the natural response when we attempt to place ourselves above God. To avoid this fear, we must acknowledge our position before God. 
We must acknowledge that we are slaves and that God owes us nothing. Next, Mary affirmed the superiority of God's plan. Mary's response to the angel was this. May your word to me be fulfilled. She didn't argue with him. She didn't debate him. She didn't try to, to prove her point. In saying these words, Mary was setting aside any dreams, any plans, any desires that she had for her own life. Having a child out of wedlock was a disgrace. She had no guarantee that Joseph or, or any other man would take her as a wife. She was saying, God, you know best, and I will act and trust in you. Mary was forsaking all the plans and dreams that she had for her life to say yes to God. Perhaps we know nothing of Mary's heritage and so much about her sons because her family did not approve or believe in her mission. Either way, we know that, that Mary's divinely formed path was difficult. And yet she still affirmed that God's plan was best. Finally, Mary accepted being alone. This is probably the, the most difficult. The story concludes with a young teenage girl who was just told that her life would be turned upside down. And then she is left alone. The angel left her. Very soon she would be with Elizabeth. In fact, that's where she goes next. But before she is with Elizabeth, she is alone. The angel had left her. Nobody else heard the angel's message. Many likely won't believe her story when she tells them anyway. There's no precedent for a virgin birth. Eventually she's going to have to face the man she's pledged to be married to and he may not necessarily understand. She will face the scorn of her society for bearing a child out of wedlock. She will be unmarriable, threatening to bring dishonor to whatever home she enters. She will be shunned. She will be alone. What will she do with this news? Only she can answer that question. Only she can, can determine what she does from here. But her previous statements give us an idea of her response. And I can only imagine that, that during these quiet moments, after the angel left, something along the lines of, the Lord is the one who will go before you. He will be with you. He will not leave you or abandon you. Do not be afraid or discouraged. That something like this was going through her mind. Because everyone was going to leave her. We rightly fear being alone in this world. Nobody wants their friends or their family to turn their back on them. Nobody wants to be rejected. But what Mary understood was that even though she was alone and that she may be for quite some time. God would see her through because she had encountered God's favor. The truth is that following God will likely lead to you being alone. Paul was alone in prison. John was exiled to an island. The word of God may drive away those who don't want to hear it and they are going to blame you. They are going to shoot the messenger. God may call you to move across the country or move across the world in order to serve him. These are, are very real possibilities. There's a very real chance that in serving God, you will end up alone, at least for a time just like Mary. But just like Mary, you will also encounter God's favor. The favor of God 
confronts us today too. God has favored us and the result is our invitation to step into faith, to receive him. God is calling us to himself to experience the forgiveness of sins. God is convicting us for change. To give our hidden or persistent sins to him. God is calling us to consecration, to be set apart, to give everything. Our family, our dreams, our entire lives over to him. Like Mary, we can find ourselves asking the question, how can this be? How can God call me to himself? I've done so much. My life is such a mess. Doesn't he know how badly I have screwed this thing up? Doesn't he know how dirty I am? Yes. Yes, he does. And he loves you anyway. How can God call me to ministry? How can God call me to serve him? That's not a part of my plan. I don't have that in my five-year plan. I was going to get a job. I was going to get married. I was going to have kids. Doesn't God know that this is going to mess all of that up? Doesn't he know that I have desires and plans for my own life? How can God... Call me to give generously, to give sacrificially. Doesn't he know that that's not in my budget? Doesn't he know that I have bills to pay? I have investments. I have commitments. I have worked hard for my money. How can God call us to marital faithfulness, to abstinence before marriage? That's so old school. Doesn't he know the world doesn't work like that anymore? Have you ever asked any of these how can this be questions? When God has sent you a messenger, someone who has brought you the word of God, have you shot the messenger? And I'm not just talking about pastors or teachers. I'm talking about friends, parents, children, family members, people who have told you an unsettling truth, people who have told you something that was uncomfortable who have spoken God's plan, God's favor into your life. Sigmund Freud called shooting the messenger a way of fending off what is distressing or unbearable. Mary may not have been able to shoot her messenger, but she could have told him no. Mary could have hardened her heart. She could have closed her ears. She could have run away. She could have ignored the angel's words. But she didn't. Mary said yes. She acknowledged her position. She acknowledged the superiority of God's plan. She accepted that this plan may very well lead to her being alone. Her friends and her family abandoning her. But in doing so, she became the model for all of us. She shows how we too can respond to God's grace to overcome fear. How we can move away from a place of fear and that we can experience God's peace in our lives. Because when we acknowledge God, when we acknowledge His plan, when we place Him above us and all that that includes, God will give us his peace. A peace that surpasses all understanding. What message is God trying to tell you? What message is God trying to send a messenger to deliver to you? If you want to move from a place of fear to a place of peace, you're going to have to listen to the message. You cannot shoot the messenger. You're going to have to take your fingers out of your ears. You're going to have to open your eyes and you're going to have to acknowledge who you are. You're going to have to acknowledge God's plan 
and the, what that may mean in your life. If you want peace in this life, and that's exactly what God is offering, you're going to have to be willing to follow him to get there. You're going to have to face the trials. You're going to have to acknowledge where you are, knowing that God will go before you, knowing that God's peace will be yours, that God's favor will shine upon you if you're willing to move from a place of fear to a place of peace. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, I thank you for this Advent season. Lord, I thank you for your peace. The Lord, when we are willing to follow you and all that that entails, no matter how scary it may be, no matter how uncertain that path may go, but Lord, when we are willing to follow you sight unseen, the Lord, we experience your favor. That Lord, you have promised to give us your peace. And Lord, that's what we are seeking. Amid the turmoil of our lives, the ups and downs, the craziness, the heartache. Lord, we each desire peace. And yes, in this world, we may find it for a short period as things are going great. But Lord, in you, in you, we find everlasting peace. Amid the trials, amid the hard times, Lord, in you, we find a godly peace. And so, Lord, I pray that we would be willing to face the fears, that we would be willing to put them aside and to focus our eyes upon you, that, Lord, that we would step into your favor, that we would step into your peace and all that that brings with it. Lord, may we follow Mary's example. And may we say, may your word to me be fulfilled. Lord, that is our prayer today as we prepare for Advent, as we prepare for, for Christ's coming. Lord, may we experience your peace. Go with us this week, Lord, in your glory and truth. May we step into your peace in this Advent season. We pray in your holy name. Amen.